space, the final frontier. These are the voyages of the starship Enterprise. Its five-year mission to explore strange new worlds, to seek out new life and new civilizations, to boldly go where no man has gone before. Hello, and welcome to the second in the series of Live from CERN webcast. Back in 1960, when Gene Rodenberry and his team were writing the first series of Star Trek, they had the smart idea to use antimatter to fuel the engines of the mighty Starship Enterprise. Back in those days, this was science fiction, but they guessed that in 300 years' time, when the Starship was supposed to fly, it might be possible. Today, some 40 years on, it still is science fiction. But in the intervening years, scientists have made a lot of progress. It's now possible to make tiny quantities of antimatter and study it. Not to make fuel to propel rocket ships, but to help answer some fundamental questions about our universe. Where I'm standing today is certainly not science fiction. I'm at the world's first antimatter producing factory at CERN, the European Laboratory for Particle Physics, just outside Geneva on the French-Swiss border. In fact, I'm standing in the control room of a running particle accelerator, as I hope you might be able to see on the monitor behind me. I also hope that you can see down in the experimental hall the equipment and apparatus that international teams of physicists have put together to make antimatter and study its properties. What are those names on the barracks that you can see? Azakusa, Atra, Athena. Well, we're going to be telling you lots more about them later in the program. And you're also going to have the opportunity to meet some of the physicists and accelerator specialists who are working there tonight. For now, it's time to go to Paula in our studio, who's going to give you more information about the program and is going to set things up for you to go on your own voyage of discovery into the world of antimatter, accompanied by some very special guests. Thank you, Mick. Welcome to the Live from CERN webcast studio. We're actually only a few hundred meters away from the antimatter factory, the AD, where Mick was. And this is the CERN Visitor Center. This is an exhibition where we show our scientific instruments to the general public. For instance, this thing here on my left, this is the UA1 detector, something that uh, made CERN able to win a Nobel Prize back in 1984. And here in the audience, I recognize a few people who helped us put everything together. This is Jordi Boixader, who made the nice drawings you saw here on the backdrop and also on our award-winning website. And close to him is Tom Humphrey from the Exploratorium in San Francisco. Actually, the Exploratorium is our mentor in webcasting, and th this is a co-production with them. And uh, they're also following us live over the internet uh, from the webcast studio at their science center in San Francisco. Hello, Exploratorium, and make sure you have questions for us that you can email to us later on in the show. So as Mick said, this webcast is about the antimatter factory. We are going to reveal to you the recipe for making antimatter. And scientists here in the studio and back at the AD are going to show you how we do that. Of course, all of you can ask us questions. You here from the studio audience, just raise your hands when I tell you it's question time. And people over the internet, send us emails. We are going to read them through and answer them during question time. So it's now time to introduce our first guest scientist, Rolf Landwa. Hi, Rolf. Hi, Welcome Paola. to the studio. Hi. So Rolf works at one of the experiments you saw in the AD. It's called Athena, and it is an international team of scientists from all over the world who are trying to study antimatter. So Rolf, can you tell us very simply, what's the point of all this? Why do you want to study antimatter? Well, I hope that becomes clear during the program, but to say it in simple terms, um, antimatter is studied because we want to understand better why we are here, why there's anything material which we can touch. 
So because we believe that at the very beginning, at the Big Bang, everything was energy. And what happened is that this energy converted into matter and antimatter, but in exactly equal parts. But now if you look around, there's no antimatter here, there's no antimatter in the universe. And we want to understand where is it gone and why does it disappear? If there was a complete symmetry, we should just be photons floating through the universe. So why we are here, that is the mystery, and that motivates our research. So that seems to be quite relevant for us uh, in the universe. And uh, I think we should learn more, a little bit more about this mystery by watching at the first video clip that our technical team has prepared for us. About 15 billion years ago, the universe had a very dramatic start called the Big Bang. A huge amount of energy concentrated in a very small region of space converted into mass and exactly equal amounts of particles and antiparticles were created. In the first instance after the Big Bang, particle-antiparticle pairs annihilated back to radiation and the radiation created new pairs again. But as the universe expanded and cooled down, the energy of the radiation became too small for creating new particles and antiparticles. If there had been perfect symmetry between matter and antimatter, only radiation and nothing else would be left. But there is matter around to form the stars and the galaxies, the sun and the earth, and finally, us. Why did this matter survive the battle with antimatter, and why is there no antimatter left? Physicists at the CERN's antiproton decelerator are now trying to unveil this deep mystery of our universe. The simplest atom, hydrogen, makes up about three quarters of the known mass of the universe. It consists of a proton and an electron. An anti-universe would then consist mostly of atoms of anti-hydrogen made of an anti-proton and a positron. Would such an anti-universe look exactly the same as our universe? By creating anti-hydrogen atoms and comparing their properties with those of hydrogen, physicists will try to answer this question. So, Rolf, how are you going to try and answer this very fundamental question? Well, <clears throat> what we are doing is one aspect of studying antimatter. So what we try to do is to make anti-hydrogen atoms. That's the first step. And then the second step will be to compare, compare these anti-hydrogen atoms with hydrogen. So this we will do, and if there's any difference, even at a tiny um, level, that would be a very important discovery. I know what hydrogen is, but I, I can't quite gather what anti-hydrogen is. Well, that sounds a bit um, different, yeah. Well, actually, a hydrogen is just made of a proton in the middle, a heavy big particle, and then a little electron floating around it, orbiting it. And um, anti-hydrogen is just um, the same kind of atom, but made of the anti-particles. So an anti-proton in the center, a negative particle and a positive electron called a positron orbiting so around it. So quite the opposite. That's question. right. It's a mirror image of matter somehow. And how do you make one? Well, first, in very simple terms, you have to convert um, energy into matter and antimatter, into particles and antiparticles, so antiprotons. Then you have to collect them and decelerate them because it's very difficult to um, make antihydrogen when the particles are moving fast. So you have to decelerate them, then trap them in little penning traps and um, mix them with positrons. And only then you can make anti-hydrogen. doesn't look easy at all to me. Uh, and this is exactly what we are we're trying to show to you. How do we make this thing, this antimatter? And to do that, we've recruited a very special team. Here is Sophie, Jennifer, and Laura, our Mission Impossible team this evening. Hi, Jennifer. Hi, Sophie. Hi, Laura. <laughs> so, Sophie, can you tell us which school you go to? Uh, the International and you, Jennifer? Um, actually, I, go to I see. And Laura, are you, uh, is physics your preferred subject? Um, no, we don't study. We don't study it yet. So they're too young to study physics, and this is really a mission impossible, I think. That's right. So Listen we have very carefully to Rolf, who is going to give to you exactly the instructions so to accomplish the mission. Prepared a little folder for you, and as usual, we have to follow these instructions very precisely in order to solve the mystery of how to make anti-hydrogen.
team has been chosen to help solve the mystery of the universe. We want you to produce atoms of anti-hydrogen and bring them to our headquarters. This task will be extremely difficult. You will need antiprotons and positrons, but be very careful to avoid contact with ordinary matter. This would lead to immediate annihilation of the antiparticles. Our spy satellite has detected the only place on Earth where all the necessary ingredients can be found. CERN, the European Laboratory for Particle Physics in Geneva, Switzerland. On arrival, you will meet Mick Storr, who will introduce you to the CERN experts who can help you succeed in your mission. First, you have to convert energy into particles and antiparticles. For this, you need to meet Django Manjunki at the Proton Synchrotron, who will make antiprotons for you. Tommy Erickson will help you collect the antiprotons in the antiproton decelerator. His colleague, Stefan Mori, will be able to reduce their speed to a tenth of the speed of light. The final step of your mission will be the most demanding. Nobody has yet succeeded to produce slow-moving anti-hydrogen atoms. Peter Yesley from the ATRAP experiment will fill your electromagnetic bottle with slow-moving antiprotons. Terry Watson from the Athena experiment will supply 100 million positrons. Your mission is to bring back both these bottles to our headquarters and to make anti-hydrogen. You have 30 minutes to accomplish your task. This document will self-destruct in five seconds. Good luck, good luck, good luck, good luck, good luck, good luck, good luck. Hi, so you're my Mission Impossible team. Laura, Jennifer, and Sophie. You know what you have to do? We've got to go and see, first of all, Django Mangunki Manglunki at the PS control room. Now to get into the PS control room, you have to take this magnetic card. Don't lose it. So you've got 30 minutes from now. Don't run. Be safe. Out you go through that door and there's somebody waiting to take you. Good luck. So please don't worry. We're not sending these girls out on a real Mission Impossible on their own in the dark around CERN. They are going to be looked after and there's somebody going to guide them around the laboratory. While they're on, we're on their way, it's time for us to tell you a little bit about where they're going. So Rolf has produced a schematic diagram on the wall behind me to show you what they're going to be doing. Where are they going, Rolf? Well, these are the different steps they have to take in order to get there. So we will go keep track of them and follow their path through CERN in order to make anti-hydrogen. So I think the first step will be to go to this proton accelerator, which is called the PS. Okay. Rolf, we've used the word accelerator a lot already this evening. I've used it, you've used it, and it's written on the board here. What is a particle accelerator and what does it do? Well, let me just get my first tool here, which is uh, a high-tech instrument, which I will use to demonstrate what an accelerator will do. Well, an accelerator makes particles go faster. And very simply speaking, charged particles are attracted by electric fields, the same electric fields which I generate when I separate some charges here, and maybe that works, voila. So you see the acceleration which is exerted by electric fields, yeah, just from separated charges. So we put these charges here along this way on electrodes, and they make the particles go fast, and then they're injected into these accelerator, and there are some accelerating devices in there, and every time they come through here, they get a kick. And then we have lots of magnet around here, which bends the trajectory of the particle. And that's every time they go a bit faster. And in the end, they reach a speed of light. OK, thank you. So the girls are heading for the proton synchrotron, the PS, control room to meet Django. They're, going, they're then going to continue their journey. And they will end up in the CERN's antimatter factory, I guess. It's not too far to the PS control room, so if we start to take a look, I think they might be just about there. There you can see the experimental hall close to the PS control room, and if we're lucky, we might pick up the girls and say, yes, here they are. Is your name Django? Hi, yeah, that's me. Do you know how to make antiprotons? Yes, yeah, that's what I do for a living. Um, we would need about 10 million, but very quickly. Is that a problem? Is that a problem, but what do you need them for? We have to make antihydrogen atoms in the next 27 minutes. How do you make antiprotons? You remember Einstein e equals mc squared? Well, the, the aim of the game is to convert energy into mass. 
So we concentrate a lot of energy into tiny particles, protons. Then we send those high energy particles on a block of matter. There, those protons with high energy will collide with the protons of the matter and their energy will be converted into pairs of particles and antiparticles. Among those antiparticles are the antiprotons. Where do you take the protons from? The protons, we take them from a hydrogen bottle. The simplest of the elements is hydrogen. Its atom is just made of one proton and an electron orbiting around it. So with an electric discharge, we can separate the two and just keep the protons. We accelerate those protons in our high energy accelerators. And how do you accelerate them? Uh, the acceleration is done with uh, electric fields, uh, which are produced in uh, radio frequency cavities. So we have this device that accelerates the protons, and we force those protons to go through this device several hundred thousand times. Until then, they are at the proper energy to be sent to uh, produce antiprotons. Um, can we fill our special container with these antiprotons? Well, first, you would need to collect them and slow them down before you can put them in your container. And how do we slow them down? This is the job of my friend Tommy. And where can we find him? Well, let me take you there. So while Jennifer, Laura and Sophie head for Tommy at the AD, let me ask a question to Rolf. It seems that everything starts from um, hydrogen, basically. That's right. Hydrogen to end up in anti-hydrogen. That's right. So we have the hydrogen bottle, which Django mentioned. That's right at the beginning of the voyage of these particles. We get rid of the electron in the hydrogen atom by its strong discharge. And then we have this device, an accelerator, many little accelerators behind each other called linear accelerator. And then they are going in there and accelerated practically to the speed of light. And then they hit a target and then energy is transformed into particles and antiparticles. So I understand what gives energy to the particle is the accelerator itself. That's right. The energy is given to the particle and then in the collision um, the, um, of this particle with another particle, energy is transformed into matter and antimatter. And I've prepared here another little uh, device which gives you an idea about what, how you could imagine what antimatter is. Just imagine this um, little star here. That is the condensed energy which we put into a proton. And if we do that, and if I manage to produce antimatter, voila, um, you see that I leave here the little mirror image of this star. That's a little bit the idea we have what about the relationship between matter and antimatter. You know, very symmetric, but just one the opposite of the other. The charge, for example, is just opposite. And I can revert that process and produce pure energy. <laughs> I see. Maybe we should check on the status yes. of the girls' progress. Yes. They've gone off to see Tommy Erickson in the AD control room. And with a bit of luck, we can go to the AD control room. That's where I was before. That's where I was speaking from, right Are at the you beginning. Tommy oh, there he is. The AD team. Yes, I am. Uh, can I help you? The PS accelerator just made 10 million antiprotons. Django said that you know how to capture them and slow them down. Is that true? Yes, that's what we do here right now. Jan I think Django told you that uh, we have a production target and you have a bunch of protons hitting the target. So on the other end of the target, you get uh, a spray, like when you use a spray can, of antiprotons and other particles. So to capture as much as possible of these particles, we use uh, something we call a magnetic core. And this works as a lens. So once the particles have been through the lens, they go down parallel down the beam line towards the AD ring. How do you manage to only capture antiprotons? Well, after this lens, this magnetic form, the beam line is no longer straight. It makes a big turn to the right, and then it comes back to the left to find the original track again. And this means that particles which are heavier, they will go straight ahead. And particles which are lighter, they will be bent too much and particles with a positive charge, remember the antiprotons have a negative charge, the positively charged particles will go the wrong way and get lost against the vacuum chamber. How many protons do you need to make uh, 10 million antiprotons? Oh, we need loads. We need about 10 billion, 10 million millions. So that means for, for every million of protons that's hitting the target, we get only one single antiproton coming into the ring. When the antiprotons pass through the magnetic field, do they become slower? 
No, they keep the same speed. The magnetic field can only change the direction of the particles. If you want to know how to uh, slow them down, we have to go and talk to my colleague, Stefan Moring. I can just call him, actually, because he's around here somewhere. that you want to make anti-hydrogen? Mm. We need your help to slow down antiprotons. We've got 10 million of them in the antiproton decelerator, but they're still moving too fast. Could you help us, please? You can try. Mm. You know, the AD machine has a conference of 182 meters, and at present speed, the antiprotons make more than one million turns in one second. So I understand it's very hard to capture them. Can you slow them down somehow? Yes, you know, in such a machine like a decelerator or accelerator, we have a very important device, which is called the radio frequency cavity. This cavity produces an electric field, and in case of deceleration, this electric field is produced in the opposite direction of the movement of the particles. So in this way, each time the particles pass through this cavity, the speed is reduced. And by doing this, over and over, the speed is reduced down to the tenth of the speed of light. Is it possible to capture them and carry them away? Yes. Two experiments are doing that. And these two experiments are called ATRAP and ATINA. And they are installed in the experimental area inside the AD ring. So I propose to you to go and to have a discussion with somebody from ATRAP experiment. They have invented a technique to trap antiprotons. So let's go. ATRAP experiment is just downstairs. Great. Thank you very Thank much. You. So while our Mission Impossible team is going to meet ATRAP, I'm just reminding you that very soon there's going to be the first question time. So think of your questions. Francesca, a student of physics from Geneva and former explainer at the Exploratorium, is going to hand the microphone over. And then Rosie is going to tell us which people have sent us an email with questions. In the meantime, my colleagues Rolf and Mick are behind the wings to show you something very interesting. Yes, thank you, Paola. Well, today we're very lucky to be in the visitor center at CERN because in the visitor center we've got lots of interesting exhibits. And of course, for those of you who are out there watching on the internet, it's important to know that you can come to visit CERN. Rolf, what have we got here? Well, we've just heard Tommy talking about this um, production target. You might expect something very complicated, but in fact it's amazingly simple. It's a block of metal. And that's where it all happens. A beam of protons, whoosh, comes in here, hits some copper or iridium, whatever, and there, in these collisions, um, a spray of particles and antiparticles is produced and comes out on this side here. One in a million is an antiproton. And these antiprotons and all the other ones are then focused through this um, guy here, which is called a magnetic horn, very strong magnetic field, and focused into this quadrupole with this um, big magnet, which you see here, with four pole shoes. And that is the first in a series of magnets, which then lead into the antiproton decelerator. Okay, so Tommy was talking about the target and the horn, and the antiproton decelerator was what Stefan was talking about. I'd just like to remind you that you can visit CERN, we have 30,000 people who come here every year. If you want to do so, take a look at the CERN website and contact the visit service because they'll be really pleased to help you and we'll, we will, of course, be very pleased to see you. Come back over here, Mick. So are there any questions from the studio audience first? Let's see. Raise your hands. Don't be afraid. Don't be shy. I'm sure we've got enough information here to have questions. Here we have. What's your name? Sebastian. 
Sebastian, <coughs> so what is your curiosity about well, it? Well, if you can make antimatter, can you make anti-man? Can you make an anti-man? Well, this is a really interesting question. This is a Rolf, question for Robert, for you. Huh? <laughs> well, let's f first make a few anti-atoms and then think about that question again. I mean, the first difficulty I see is that we are not only made of hydrogen. I mean, we are made of carbon and oxygen and nitrogen, many other atoms. They are much more, more difficult to make because they contain many more particles inside. So that's the first difficulty. And then we are made of many, many particles, billions and billions and billions. And they have to be put in the right order. <laughs> Otherwise, we are not sort of what we used to be. So I think these are difficult things. So I have my doubts if that's possible. <laughs> Rosie, do we have any questions on the internet? Yes, we do. From Christoph in Germany. Compared to a light bulb, how much power does it take to run the AD? Oh, this may be a Shall question we uh, ask one Stefan. of our experts, Stefan, for example, yes, in I the am. AD? No. No, I think it's a question for Tommy. Tommy. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't yeah. hear the first part. The question is, compared to a light bulb, how much power does it take to run the AD? Um, we need about four megawatts continuously. So that's uh, yes, a few million times a light bulb. Okay, thank so you very much. A few million light bulbs to power the AD. More questions from the audience or from the internet? Rosie, have you got internet. one, Rosie? Yes, <clears throat> from Maeva in France. When and where was the first antiproton machine built? What about okay. Stefan? Can Stefan take Stefan that one? <laughs> yes, you know, the first machine has been built uh, uh, at Geneva, at CERN, in 1981. And this machine has been called the antiproton accumulator. And uh, per day, we were able to accumulate about 10 to the 11 in 24 hours. But then, in 1986, because the demand of the antiproton was so large with uh, all the users, so another ring has been added. And uh, this ring has been called the antiproton collector, AC. So at the, with the two machines, we were able to accumulate 10 to the 12 antiprotons per day. Rolf, maybe you can tell us what 10 to the 12 means. Well, that is a million times a million, roughly. A million times a million. That's right. Maybe I add one thing to that. I mean, of course, that was the first time one could speak of big amounts of antiprotons, but the very, very first antiproton has been produced in 1955 in Berkeley. There was Berkeley. a special machine built there, the Webertron, and that produced the first antiproton. Berkeley, California, California. USA. USA. That's right. Okay. But that was just one, and that's a million, million, so it's a big progress. More questions? Yes, a gentleman yes, in the audience yes. here. Wait for the mic. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> what is the size of the vessel that the antiprotons are stored in, and what is the temperature characteristics, the metallic characteristics of it? Is it something that I could carry in my hand, or do I need a forklift? Maybe we postpone that question because we will come in a minute to the question, how do we do exactly that? And you will see a little model here. Is that okay? Would you, do you mind postponing yeah. the question? Keep it in your mind, everybody, because we will come back to that one. Can we take another one? Yes, there's a gentleman here. Thank you. Is antimatter being produced anywhere else in the universe? I guess this is for you, Rolf. Okay, <laughs> so we would like to know if there is an anti-galaxy somewhere. We haven't seen one so far. I mean, we would only be able to see it in contact with ordinary matter. We look for radiation, which is produced in the annihilations. But um, you, could, you have to make the subtle distinction between antiparticles and antimatter. When we talk about antimatter, we talk about atoms, complete atoms, which make matter. Antiparticles are positrons, and they are produced in radioactive decays quite naturally. Antiprotons, on the other hand, are very difficult to make. You need an extreme lot of energy, and that seems not to be available in the universe. So um, uh, positrons, yes. Antiprotons, no. Yeah, and maybe we can add that there are experiments where CERN participates That's that are right. actually looking if there are any traces of antiatoms in outer space. That's, right. That's the <laughs> Alpha Magnetic Spectrometer, AMS, which will look for anti, heavy anti-nuclei in the um, cosmic radiation. 
One more question, more question from the internet, Rosie? Yes. Uh, John is asking, why does the accelerator has to be so big? Where does John come from, please? I don't know. He doesn't <laughs> say. He doesn't say. Okay. Uh, Tommy or Stefan, why does the accelerator have to be so large? You know, the AD machine has been built in 1997. But before, I just I said, uh, we had two machines, an antiproton accumulator, an antiproton collector. And then in 1996, the both machine has been shut down, I should say. So new ideas came, and then we have to build uh, an antiproton decelerator. But to have a very slow, low cost, we have reused all the magnets from the antiproton collector. So it's the reason why the antiproton decelerator today is large. But, uh, you know, by using the new technique, like, for example, um, cryogenic and, uh, how to say, um, superconducting magnets, of course, we could have a really smaller ring. Okay, thank you very much. We're going to have to cut short this question and answer session right now, but I'll remind you that we can take questions at the end of the program. Let's check up on the progress of our girls, but first of all, I think, Rolf, you're clutching a piece of cardboard that you're dying to stick onto the, the wall here. <laughs> what is it? We have to show what the girls okay. have done so far, and they have talked about this obstacle course which the antiprotons have to go through after they have um, been produced in the target. So this is the sign they are seeing. All the antiprotons manage to get through these obstacle course easily because it's set up to just let them transmit. But all the other particles which are produced, they go left, right into the walls. That's how we manage to get just the antiprotons in here, very few other particles. And then they come in here with this pretty high speed of 288,000 kilometers per second. And you have seen Stefan, as he got decelerated, he got slower and slower and slower. And then at the leisurely speed of 30,000 kilometers per second, they come out, are ejected, and then there is these two experiments, ATRAP and Athena. Now this is where the girls are going, ATRAP and Athena. What do they mean? Well, ATRAP just stands for antimatter trap, and Athena stands for anti-hydrogen apparatus. Both are international collaborations of five to seven different countries together, and they are teams of researchers which have the goal to produce anti-hydrogen atoms and to study them. Okay, so I think it's time to check on progress. Let's hope the girls are going to meet Peter at the ATRAP. Can we take a look? Yes, here they come. Peter Leslie from the ATRAP team. Well, yes, I am. How can I help you? We need slow antiprotons to make antihydrogen. Would you know where to capture them? Well, I certainly do. Uh, when the antiprotons come to our trap from the accelerator, they're going near the speed of light. And so we have to make a trap to capture them. Our trap is made out of little rings like this, a column of them. And they're just about the size of a wedding ring. And what we do to make this trap is we have voltages and we let one side down, just sort of like making a mouse trap in some sense, and the antiprotons come rushing in, and before they get out, we close the door and we have them trapped in nothing. But don't the particles touch the air? Well, yeah, they would, but we take all the air out of the trap. And we do that by surrounding the trap in a, in a little bit of a can, like a Coke can. And then we pump all the air out of that can. Why, in fact, it, <clears throat> before we start, in just one cubic centimeter of air, there are a million times a billion molecules of air. So what we do is we pump that out, and when we, and we're done pumping, we have, in just a cubic centimeter, that's just the space between my fingers, we have about 30 billion molecules of air, and that's still not good enough to keep antiprotons. So af after that, what we do is we freeze that can we pump it, and then we freeze it with liquid helium, and uh, that's at four degrees above absolute zero. At that temperature, all the molecules in the air stick to the walls of the uh, 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 all the wall <coughs> stick to the walls of the trap container, and 
uh, just sort of like your breath sticks to a uh, car window on a winter day. And uh, then there's only 10 molecules left in a size of the space about the size of my fist. So in fact, there's nothing left inside. Um, and if there is anything there, how do we hold them? Well, that's a good question. What we do is we use forces that act on particles even if they don't touch the particles. Well, magnets are somewhat like that. When you have two magnets close together, you can feel that they're pushing on each other even though they don't touch, which is kind of strange if you stop and think about it a little bit. But we use a very large magnet, but it's a, uh, about 100 times larger than the magnet that you would see on your refrigerator, that you, you could put on your refrigerator. This is the magnet that you see. I'm standing right next to it now. We use this, man we use this magnet to make forces on the charged particles, and well, that's how we keep them trapped. We need to bring back um, 10,000 antiprotons to the studio. Could you help us? Well, I certainly can. Well, I've just put a few antiprotons, 10,000, in a bottle, and you're welcome to have it. It's right there. Do you know where to get positrons from? Oh, well, for positrons, you'll have to go visit Terry. She's at Athena, just right across the hall. Well, there they go, Rolf. Well I hope they don't drop that container. Yeah, we should be careful. Yep. You've got another card now to stick on our wall. Voila. So, what has happened is the antiprotons came in at 30,000 kilometers per second, and the experiment manages now with different steps to slow them down to almost absolute zero, which means to, for particles, this is a very, very, very slow speed. This is 100 meters per second, and with this speed, they move up and down into a tiny trap. Okay, now for me, I'm a bit puzzled about this concept of trap. <laughs> I don't know what you think, and so in fact, we've asked Rolf to bring, bring along an interesting piece of equipment that's over there that I hope can explain how the trap works a little better. Yeah, so essentially a trap is a piece made out of several electrodes, metallic rings, which are connected to a kind of a battery. In this case, we only use electric fields, which change. In this case, we also use a magnetic field. But just to demonstrate the principle, I've just put a little piece of styrofoam in here, and if the camera manages to focus on, on this little piece, which is spinning up and down in the middle, you see that it moves up and down, but it does not fall down. So it's kept by these electric forces right in the middle. And that gives you a good idea about how a trap works. Believe you me, the, for the people who are sitting at the back and may not be able to see, I can vouch for the fact that there is a very tiny piece of styrofoam in that trap. Now, Rolf, how many particles can a trap actually contain? Well, I mean, Peter just spoke about 10,000. This is nothing for a trap. You can easily fill 100 billion into them. But 10,000 is what we can trap right now from the antiproton decelerator. Okay, those numbers like billions uh, are big numbers to me. I'm not sure that I understand what a billion or billions are. Can you give us an idea? Well, I mean, it for, maybe I compare it with um, how much matter is in a piece of, of, of one gram or so, um, or maybe in your lungs. When you breathe in, you um, breathe in a number of atoms which is much bigger than the number of stars in the universe. It's a number with 23 zeros at the end. So this is about so 10 to the 9 or 10 to the 10 particles, so 10 zeros at the end, 10 billion. This is nothing compared to what is in, contained in one gram. It's a very small number, actually, in expressed in grams. Okay, thanks. How long can those particles sit in that trap? Well, in principle, forever. The antiprotons, as long as they don't touch normal matter, they can stay in that trap as long as you like. A trap, for example, has trapped one single antiproton and kept it for two months. Every now and then they've checked that it's still in there, if it was still in there. And only after the two months they dumped it because it was Christmas and they wanted to go home. <laughs> well, it's getting Christmas and we, we don't w yet want to go home. But let's, uh, let's check on the girls. They've got their antiprotons now. The last, uh, the last leg is to go and see if they have got can get some positrons. For that, they should be going to see Terry at Athena. Hi, 
They've made it. <laughs> From what Terry just said, uh, it seems that you need a much shorter distance to slow down the positron. That's right. They've just filled the last bottle of, with positrons. And why is it so easy? It's easy because the positrons are so much lighter than the antiprotons. That makes them easier to produce, and it also makes them easier to slow down. At the beginning, again, they move with the speed of light, but it's like a Fiat 500, which moves with the speed of light. It's much easier to stop than a thousand ton lorry, which moves through the speed of light. For the thousand ton lorry, you need such a big device. For the um, positrons, you just need this little positron um, accumulator, which we so have. So we've got a uh, Cinquecento here, big lorry there. Mm -hmm. We put them together, and let's see what happens if we put them together from the next video clip. Okay. In CERN's new antimatter factory, Production begins when the protons coming from the protosynchrotron are smashed into a target of metal about once a minute. The abrupt stopping releases a huge amount of energy and matter-antimatter particles are spontaneously created. Only one collision in a million produces the precious antiprotons that are then deflected into the antiproton decelerator. Here, while it begins to race around the ring, the bunch of newly created particles undergo the effect of different devices. The blue bending magnets make sure they stay on the right track in the middle of the vacuum pipe. The red focusing magnets adjust the size of the beam to be smaller than the size of the pipe. At each turn, the strong electric fields inside the radio frequency cavities begin to decelerate the antiprotons, which are produced at almost the speed of light. When 10% of the speed of light is reached, antiprotons are sent into one of the AD experiments. Here they enter a trapping region, where they are further slowed and kept trapped in a small volume. Meanwhile, positrons are collected from a source in a different trap and sent through a valve into the main trapping region. Positrons mix and interact with antiprotons. When a positron gets bound to an antiproton, an atom of antihydrogen is created. The antiatom drifts to the wall of the trap where it collides and annihilates with one of its constituent atoms, creating two gamma rays and pions. These particles are seen and recognized by several layers of different detectors surrounding the trap. Their presence reveals the existence of the antihydrogen atom. Many of these events happen in rapid succession until all the antiprotons are exhausted. A new AD deceleration cycle has started already, and new antiprotons will soon get trapped to start a new creation process. So, Rolf, we now know how to make antihydrogen, and I guess you've got your last yep. piece of cardboard to stick on the machine. Now we have the two ingredients and we make the cocktail 
we mix the two together very slowly. We have the antiprotons from the one side in a trap, the positron cloud in the other side, and so the antiprotons move very slowly and from time to time pick a positron and form antihydrogen. Okay, but if you have P bars, antiprotons, and you have positrons, and you put them together, I guess you've got something now which is neutrally charged. How do you manage to keep that in your bottle? Yep, that wouldn't work anymore. That's true. So um, actually, we, would have, we have no handle with electric fields. So the only resource we can take is to use this tiny um, magnetic moment it, uh, of the um, antihydrogen atom. It's like a little magnet, and by using very strong magnetic fields, which have a zero in the middle, which is a sort of a valley, and go up to the outside, we can keep them inside, and that's our plan. Okay, so let's assume that you've got these atoms of antihydrogen, but what are you going to do with them? Well, as I said at the beginning, we are looking for tiny, subtle differences between matter and antimatter. So every atom um, produces something like a fingerprint, the fingerprint of an atom that is its spectrum. So basically, we are looking for the spectrum of antihydrogen and compare it with the spectrum of hydrogen. And if the two are different, even at a level of one in a billion, one in a trillion, or even less, it would be a very interesting and important discovery. And does this re relate to the fact that we have lots of matter in the world, but we don't have any antimatter? Yes, we know that in, in the first instance of the universe, there was something happening which created the slight imbalance in favor of what we call matter. And this produced, this effect that at the end, most matter and antimatter sort of annihilated, and a little bit was left, and that's all the matter we are made of, the galaxies are made of, the universe is made of. Okay, so if I interpret that film correctly, we only know, you only know that you've made anti-hydrogen when the anti-hydrogen dies. Is that right? That's right. Bad news for the anti-hydrogen atoms. Um, in fact, when they're, as long as they are alive, they're not touching any matter, they are stable, they stay where they are. If they touch the matter, then they annihilate, and we have a little detector around it which will indicate the annihilation products, the destruction of this atom. And then we know it was there, and that will help us to, um, to, to have a signal when we have sort of um, made the experiment right. Now, I must admit, at this point in time, I personally am a little bit confused, not with the story that we've been telling, but what's going to happen now. Because when I left this studio at half past seven to go up to the AD, I wasn't sure whether we were going to talk about another experiment at the AD now, or whether we're going to do that later. Rolf, can you help me? Yeah, I think we are speaking about that experiment in a minute, because the, second ex the third experiment which we have is called ASAXA, and as the name indicates, it's a part of Tokyo. Um, it has a strong Japanese um, uh, component, so we are talking about that in a minute. Okay. I think we should find uh, Masaki Hori now, who is uh, one of the members of this experiment. Hi, Masaki. Hello. So, uh. I understand your experiment is doing something slightly different from Athena and Atrap. Well, uh, not really. What we are studying is that uh, in the beginning of this program, you saw this uh, atom. So, we make something like that and study it using lasers. Okay, uh -huh. and? <laughs> I think. Oh. Okay, uh, so also I should uh, mention that uh, although it's, uh, it's a Japanese um, name, we also have uh, physicists from Denmark and England and Germany and France and Hungary, Bulgaria, Russia and United States. So that, that's just uh, some kind of... Uh, okay. <laughs> I think I understand that what you're actually doing is to take a helium atom, which is made of a nucleus, and two electrons, yes. and then you take one of these electrons out, uh -huh. and you put the antiprotons in its place. Yes. And then by studying very precisely how this atom behaves, mm -hmm. you can sort of get something out about this antiproton, don't you? Well, yeah. well if you make the complicated explanation, that's <laughs> correct. <laughs> okay. But fundamentally, what we do is uh, study antimatter. That's yeah. right. So in a way, all, the, all three experiments are doing the same thing. So I think time is exhausting now for yes, the girls. Yes, I'm not to sure where back. the girls are. We haven't they haven't got much time left. Do you think you could go and see if they're coming? Yes, Paula? let me have a look. Yes, here they are. Here they I come. see Jennifer with a big butter in her hands rushing towards us. And Ooh. Laura and Careful, there they are. There well they done. Are. So 
you've made it. So you made it. You made some antiprotons and you've made some positrons. Could I have the microphone, please? Which bit did you enjoy best? Uh, with Terry. With Terry, making positrons. What about you, Jennifer? I must agree. I, I really like Terry. And you? Yeah, I like Terry and um, the one before Terry. Who was Peter. Peter. Peter, yeah. Peter, making antiprotons. Well, thank you, thank you very much for helping us out on this Mission Impossible. You've been absolutely successful. And, and to reward you, we're going to make you honorary members of the Live From CERN team. So if you go over to see Michelle and Rosie, they'll sign you up. Okay? Well done. Thank you. Bravo. Somebody has just arrived at our doors here. Oh, oh goodness me. Who have we got here? Yeah, look at this. I'm, I'm stuck. My, my spaceships run out of antimatter fuel. And, well, my instruments tell me that CERN is the only place in this solar system where they make antimatter. So I, I'm desperately looking for about a kilogram. So can you help me out? Well, um, we can't give you a kilogram of uh, antimatter, but you're in luck because our young friends have just made the ingredients that you need to make it, antiprotons and prositrons, so please help yourself. There you are. Take whatever you... There's enough there for a kilogram? Well, there's certainly some for you to get to the next fueling station on uh, several solar systems further on, so I, I would go if I were you. Yes, quick. Okay, okay, thanks. Go ahead. I sincerely... I sincerely hope he gets out of our solar system before he finds out that what we've actually given him is liquid nitrogen. <laughs> <laughs> and I think we should add that to make a kilogram of antimatter will take us a certain while. We produce right now at the present rate something like one billionth of a gram, one nanogram per year. So one kilogram would take us roughly like a thousand billion years, which is much longer than the age of the universe. So he would have to wait a little bit to refuel his spaceship. Okay, thank you. Paula, I think it's time to go to our final question and answer session. Yes. Is there anybody from the audience who wants to ask something? Well, we do have an outstanding matter. question. Yes. Maybe the person who asked that outstanding question could ask it again so that we can remember. Yes, that was him, I remember. Yeah. <laughs> the question I asked was the means of storage for the antiprotons okay and the positron so I think now the the clip which you have seen and the little um, demonstration experiment answers that question it's essentially a tiny system of little electrodes rings like wedding rings or so which are connected essentially to batteries and um, you can store something like um, up to a billion particles roughly in such traps and the temperature is as low as you can go but for practical reasons, it's usually 4 degrees Kelvin, which is close to absolute zero. So you're suspending them in a field? In an electric field, in a combined electric and magnetic field. That's right. And th then you apply them to, the, to the, 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 the alchemy of mixing them, which then destroys them? Well, what happens is that there is such a trap here and such a trap there. And then so when we merge these two plasmas, these two kinds of particles, then from time to time an antihydrogen atom is formed and at okay. present as long as we don't attempt to trap it, it just flies straight on, hits some material and annihilates and that we can detect. Thank you. you can see here on the screen we are in the company of Terry and Peter who are in the AD control room and they can answer your questions as well. Yeah, do we have a question from them on the internet, Rosie? Yes, we do. Isabel from Paris, she's asking have the experiments already made anti-hydrogen atoms, and how many? Okay, that's a great question for Terry or for Peter. Well, so far we haven't made any anti-hydrogen experiments, uh, anti-hydrogen atoms, and um, we haven't quite got to that stage. I think in the previous experiment at LEA, they saw of order of the 10 anti-hydrogen atoms, but that was a very high energy, as it wasn't trapped. Okay, thank you. Another question? Anybody from the audience? Yes. Gentlemen at the front and the little boy too. Um, for the, uh, if you can make anti-protons, can you make anti-neutrons? Who takes uh, that? Well, yes, I can say that. Yes, um, you are absolutely right. Um, in the same target, which is just shown here behind, um, at the same time we produce anti-protons, there are also anti-neutrons produced, and practically at the same rate. But the antineutrons are neut 
trill, as the name tries to indicate, so they just go straight on and don't care about the fields. So it's very difficult to put them into a <coughs> decelerator and act on them because they, it's very, because they're neutral, they cannot do anything. Okay, gentleman at the front. Uh, ten years ago, there was um, an experiment who was um, planned, a PS200 concerning the propa uh, gravitational properties of antimatter, uh, namely antiprotons. And uh, I know that it was abandoned because there, was, there were problems to get enough antiprotons to uh, enough low energy. And my question is, uh, is there any uh, uh, will to, to try again this experiment about gravitational properties of antiprotons? Okay, this is a certain question, so I guess Rolf should yeah. answer this one. It's, uh, yeah, a very good question. In fact, um, you're right, there was an experiment trying to see if antiprotons basically fall upwards or downwards, if gravitation acts really in the same way as for protons. The difficulty is that the charge um, is, is so much, um, the interaction between charges is so much stronger than gravitation that it's very hard to see this effect with charged particles. So in fact, um, if uh, we manage to get the anti-hydrogen atoms slow enough, we will at a later stage look if they fall down with the same acceleration as hydrogen atoms. But that is a very difficult experiment, so we are not sure when we get to that point. Okay, thank you. Rosie? Yes, Nicole from Germany. It looks to me like there are two experiments basically doing the same thing. Is this true? Okay, I guess we can ask Peter that question. Is Peter still there? Yes, hello. Uh, that is a, a very good question. In fact, there are two experiments that are doing very similar things. And I think the reason is, is because if the results that we measure are, uh, if, if we measure an important result, it's so important that we have verification from the other experiment. And so uh, if, if one experiment claims to have measured something significant, we have the other experiment to either verify that or to refute it. And I think that uh, that's, that's one of the purposes of having two experiments. Thank you, Peter. Any more from the audience? Anybody from the audience? Yes, yes. the gentleman here. Uh, yes, uh, a characteristic of the antimatter is an anti charge, okay? But why not an anti mass? Well, <coughs> you see, um, Einstein realized that mass and energy are equivalent, and both and energy and both both mass and energy curve space and cause gravitation. So, if you're talking about anti-mass, you probably implicate that this is something like anti-gravitation, also. But we believe that this um, equivalence between mass and energy is um, valid to a very high degree and it has been verified to quite a high degree. So we are sure that antimatter, to a good degree, behaves in the gravitational field like matter. But we do not know up to which level, and therefore we do experiments in order to verify that. I've seen okay. Rosie waving in the back with more questions from the internet. Hi, Rosie. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Ricardo from Villa Franca de Xira in Portugal. Portugal. Wow. He's asking, what can we do with antimatter? How can it be useful? Okay, let's, shall we ask Peter? Fine. Why not Peter? Can you answer that one, Peter? Well, I can try. <laughs> right now, uh, antimatter is useful for measuring properties, uh, scientific properties of our universe, in particular, the properties of antimatter. Uh, I think that it's still a ways off that antimatter has uh, uh, sort of uh, industrial purposes, but you can view it as sort of, uh, uh, so for the moment, it has a scientific purpose, a purpose of uh, for doing experiments. Maybe I can just add one sentence. I mean, positrons, of course, are used already for a long time for positron emission tomography. And that is also a practical use of antimatter. So what you do is you take a radioactive substance, you inject it, and it accumulates. For example, if you put it in sugar, it accumulates in active areas. And then you can see where the positrons decay, and that spots um, centers of interest in your body. OK, thanks. More, any more questions from the audience? Well, yes. we have two famous <laughs> questioners at the front here, yes. The little Very boy. active. 
um, when the LHC is built, will you still be able to make antimatter? When the LHC is built, will we still be able to make antimatter? I guess Terry can answer that one. Can you, Terry? <laughs> Yeah, sure. The, uh, the LHC is a completely different experiment. It's not going to in any way interfere with our experiments at all. Ours will still be going on, hopefully, for another five, ten years or so. It won't be a problem. Thank you. You, might, you may be wondering why uh, I keep going like this and waving my hands about. It's because people are talking into my ear here, so I'm trying to listen to them and I'm trying to listen to you. But they're telling me that Rosie's got a question on the Internet. Yes, from Marta in Italy. How many physicists work in the AD experiments? Okay, shall we go back to Terry? How many, how many physicists work in the AD experiments? Well, there are three separate experiments um, inside the AD. There's Athena, ATRAP, and As ASACUSA. Um, each of them have between 10 and 30 physicists per experiment. So there's probably in the order of 70, 80 at a time, but all for three different goals. Okay. And then there are the machine people as well. Of course, so of course, yes. There's a lot of people for the machine. <laughs> okay, thank you. And then we forgot. Yes, the gentleman, gentleman there. Here. <laughs> um, amongst terrorists, uh, are there any uh, alternative ideas about uh, an alternative mathematical description of what we actually uh, we now call positiveness or negativeness or physical scalar quantities? Because you want we to continue to use positive and negative all the ways, but maybe there would be some other <laughs> well, I'm not uh, more, yeah. uh, more um, relevant way to describe some of these uh, properties. Do you well, want to try and swallow this one, Rolf? Well, it's <laughs> I'm not quite sure that I can sort of answer the, such a deep question. But, um, of course, what is positive and what is negative is a, que a question of definition, of course. I mean, it's exchangeable completely. That is opposite is for sure. You know, I mean, that is the way we describe it. Now, physicists tend to be simplistic, and so they describe particles with the simplest possible formalism. You know, and I think for the time being, the formalism which we have to describe particles with just a positive or negative charge is very simple. Um, for the time being, I don't know um, how to replace that. Because uh, I'm thinking, yes, okay. Yeah. I'm thinking of uh, a question here about uh, uh, anti-mass for antimatter, and uh, the problem with mass is that there are inertial mass and gravitational mass, and uh, if you use we can see gravitational mass as a, a mass with a sign. Uh, the matter, who, the matter who would have a positive gravitational mass would be the same of the <coughs> uh, inertial mass without sign, for example. But the, if there is a negative gravitational mass, we, we it would not be equal to the initial positive yep. uh, uh, absolute mass. So you see, this, so because positive is as if there is nothing in numbers. Yeah. So okay. I think that's a very difficult subject which we are touching here. But very briefly answered, I think um, this equivalence principle. I mean that um, gravitational and inertial mass are the same and have the same effect is very well verified. And um, if there are deviations, they're very small. Okay, maybe you'd like to discuss with Rolf after <laughs> the program today. Have we got some questions that we might be able to direct to Tommy and uh, Stefan? Rosie, yes. Yes. Uh, Mark from England. How much antimatter has been produced since the first antiproton machine was built? Tommy or, or Stefan? Stefan? Do we have Tommy and Stefan oh. there? <laughs> They're calling them back. They were hoping that they were not going to have to. Yes. How much uh, antimatter has been produced since the first... How much antimatter has been produced? I hasn't got the headphones. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So how much antimatter has been produced this entire... This entire... How many antiprotons have been It's about uh, one, uh, one nanogram <laughs> in, in about 15 years of operation. <laughs> okay. What's a nanogram, please? Could you remind me what a nanogram is? Nanogram, that's the... 10 to the minus 9, so that's 1 divided by uh, uh, 1 and 9 zeros. It's a billion. It's a billionth of a gram. It looks a ridiculous quantity. It's pretty okay. small. No? <laughs> okay, well, thank you. I've just been told that, unfortunately, although we still have lots of questions on the Internet, 
coming from all over Europe, apparently. And we've got, still got questions in the audience now. Unfortunately, it's time to stop. We have to relinquish our internet line. So, all we can do now is say that we sincerely hope that you've enjoyed tonight's program. We hope that you've learned a little bit more about this mysterious world of antimatter and that you'll join us again because we do plan to have future series of webcasts, not only on antimatter, but on some of the other science that we do at CERN as well. We'd like to especially thank the people from the Exploratorium who've been here with us for a couple of weeks. They've given us loads of technical support. Thanks very much, guys. Thanks We'd to all the scientists who helped us this pleasure. evening. <laughs> Rolf. Especially Rolf, Thanks Tommy, Tommy, and Stefan, Terry, Bevy. and Peter, and of course, Django. And of course, we'd like to give a big special vote of thanks to our Mission Impossible team, who are now fully-fledged members of Life from CERN. Thank you.